Welcome to First Unitarian Church of Orlando. I'm Rhonda Rodriguez, a worship associate. Welcome to this morning, this day, and this opportunity to be together in community, which is a time of joy, comfort, and sometimes challenges. This Unitarian Universalist congregation is a place where we come to learn more about being human. We're not here because we figured out life's questions or because we think we've got it right. We come here to learn more about being in relationship together, how to listen, how to forgive, how to be vulnerable, and how to create trust and compassion in one another. Let us move into worship, willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves, and opening to connection in all its forms. If you'd like to know more about our congregation, go to orlandouu.org or email welcometeam at orlando.uu.org. After service today at 1130, all are invited to a time of informal fellowship. We gather and go into breakout rooms to take time to chat with each other. If you're new and want more information about the congregation, one of the breakout rooms is a welcome center where there will be several lay leaders to give you more information on our congregation. All are welcome. A reminder that an all church email went to members this week, announcing a new policy regarding small in-person gatherings indoors. The actual policy is also on the member section of our website. I've been thinking this week about events around the country, particularly the shooting that just happened in San Jose. And a friend of mine posted on Facebook about how, well, one person posted that they had no reaction at all, that this has happened so many times that they just can't have a reaction anymore. And another friend posted a message of really despondence 
that this country is never going to get it right. I don't know whether that's the case or not, but I do know that in times like these, having our communities and the closeness of our communities is more important than ever. I've stayed through one U with my family, through all of these things that have happened through COVID because of that sense of community. Even though we can't see each other in person, although hopefully, hopefully that's going to change soon. It is changing soon. Being together gives us strength to get through the times of trial and being together allows us to link our minds and our hearts and to come up with solutions so that this world can be a better place. That's my hope. I give to the church because without giving, there can be no gaining. Right? It's only in our giving, our support, whatever level that support might be, that change can truly come. So if you'd like to make an offering to support the many ministries of this congregation, go to orlandouu.org and click the donate button in the upper right corner. You can send a text or send a check. You're also invited to support one of our community partners in our Share the Plate program. This is the final Sunday in May where we are supporting iDignity that helps the disadvantaged get personal identification. Here's how you can give to Share the Plate. It's great being together again. Now, Let's continue with worship. These words from Wendell Berry call us together. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound and fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, 
I go lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things, who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel the day-blind stars waiting for their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Come, let us worship together. Good morning, we're the Hoopers. I'm George. And I'm Kay. It's a tradition in Unitarian Universalist churches to light a flaming chalice in worship. We do this to create a reverent space for reflection, for prayer and meditation, and for song. So join us as we say those traditional words as we light our chalice. In the, in the light, light of truth, truth and in the, the warmth of love, love we, we gather, gather to, to seek, seek, to sustain, and, and to share. share. And so we reach another transition. As many of you know, this is my last Sunday here as religious educator here at First Unitarian Church of Orlando. Not going far. In fact, I still plan on being a member of the church, but it's a change for all of us. It's a change for me personally. I'll be starting a new job, which means I'll have to learn all sorts of new things. It'll also be a change for you and for the religious enrichment program here. I'm leaving the program in the best of hands, and I'm completely confident that this team of staff and volunteers will continue this good work that we have done together. But of course, there'll be bumps in the road for all of us. And as we go through these changes, I hope that we can all give ourselves, each other, and our church some grace. Have you ever heard that phrase, giving yourself grace? What does that mean to you, the word grace? I like to think of it as permission to just be, to accept yourself for who you are and what you can do, to be kind to yourself as you try new things and hard things. You'll make mistakes. We all do. No one's perfect. And no one is born simply knowing how to do everything in this great wide world. We have to give ourselves grace and trust that everything is not going to be perfect the first time but it's gonna be okay, we'll get there. I hope all of you are able to give yourselves and those around you grace as you approach new unknowns, a time, a state of being that author Angela Dieterlisi calls the magical yet. The magical yet, words by Angela Dieterlisi, art by Lorena Alvarez. There are days when your dreams haven't come true, or you're upset by the things you can't do. If you've lost or failed or cried just a bit, you're tired of waiting, ready to quit. Like that shiny new bike you couldn't ride, and it didn't matter how hard you tried. You couldn't pedal and you couldn't steer, and you couldn't get that bike into gear. Then, when you thought you were on the right track, you popped a wheelie and fell on your back. And now you won't ride. No way. Not never. No riding for you. You'll walk. Forever. Don't give up now. There's a major game changer. The most amazing thought rearranger. Someone to show you how good you can get. Now introducing the magical yet. With this yet's magic, you can begin to see that you're going beyond where you've been. There are so many things that you've learned to do when you didn't know the yet was with you. Like when you babbled before you could talk, or how you crawled before you could walk. Yet, a dreamer, a schemer, a hoper, a trier, a maker, a doer, I gotta fly higher. This yet finds a way, even when you don't, and yet knows you will when you think you won't. 
like that shiny new bike that you couldn't ride, hop right back on with the yet by your side. Yet doesn't mind warm-ups, fixes and flops, do-overs, redos, stumbles, and stops. Yet knows there's mistakes, some big and some small, with yet you're sure to get over them all. Play the kazoo or play the bassoon, jam with the yet and you'll soon be in tune. So they all have their little yets. Try skateboarding tricks like the ollie heel flip. The, this yet can get to the championship. Tongue twisters twisted your tongue in a knot. Yet says keep trying and practice a lot. Be patient. Yet can't do it all overnight. Some things they take days, months, or years to get right. But if you keep leaping, dreaming, wishing, waiting, learning, trying, missing... With the yet as your guide along the way, you'll do all the things you can't do today. Now you're bolder, braver, starting to see. With the yet, you can get where you want to be. You finally did it. Yet knew you could. You're not just writing. You're getting quite good. But don't stop now. You've got so much to do. The good news is this yet grows with you. So no matter how big or old you may get, you'll never outgrow. You'll never forget. You can always believe in the magic of yet. And now we enter a time of mindfulness, of meditation, and prayer and has always set aside the time for the hearing of the joys and sorrows in our congregation and in the world. This week, news came from San Jose, California of the loss of life of 10 people in another mass shooting. We mourn for them and their families and decry the injustice of such things. This being Memorial Day weekend, of course, we honor those who have lost their lives and this generation and in generations past while in service to the military. And of course, we remember the unspoken sorrows of our life, and we know that the light of the sacred shines into the dark and broken places of our lives and all life. Together, let's take a deep breath. Mindful that this necessary and simple act declares our interdependence with each other and with all hundreds of times a day. Our prayer today is from Unitarian Universalist minister, the Reverend Wayne Arneson, in honor of Memorial Day. Spirit of life, we enter into the season of Memorial Day surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses. We remember, first of all, the women and men who are currently serving in the armed forces. We pray for their safe return. We also acknowledge there are women and men who will not return as we grieve their passing in the daily newspaper. We honor their service and their sacrifice. We also give thanks for all the women and men who have served in the nation's armed services. Those who have not served cannot fully imagine the experience of war, but we do know war's aftermath and the toll that it can take on the human heart. This day remembers and acknowledges loss, and so do we remember those whom we have loved and lost. We hold their names and their faces in our mind's eye. We recall the gifts they gave to us through the strength of their being, the depth of their love, the courage of their dying, and the fullness of their living. They live with us in blessed memory, a tribute to all that they have meant to us. And so we are mindful of the sufferings in our community and our world. We pray for all those who are hurting in any manner of body, mind, or spirit, 
For these and for all, we pray for a greater sense of peace, fulfillment, health, vigor, relationship, abundance, and sufficiency in all things. Now, with the private meditations of our hearts, we enter the silence and the communion of names. And so it is. And so we pray, blessed be, amen. there is a season this day when the dawn aflame with flower and the fawn with fragile wonder finds the newness of her legs when the dew of birth and blossom breathes new in fragrance and in flight we honor the light through translucent petals and gossamer sprouts, glowing within you and flowing without. We honor the light. From the stars who bore you, of the hope which soared through the resurrected night, we honor the light, guiding one another, once asunder, to their source. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch 
like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. snares I have already come tis grace hath brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first Amazing Grace. John Newton wrote the words. He was an Anglican priest in England when he premiered the song in 1773. It's based on his experience of having previously survived a near-death experience while as the captain of a slave ship. That experience caused his conversion to Christianity and his eventual abolitionism against slavery. It was a familiar anthem in the American Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s as it had made its way into the black church experience. The lyrics speak of freedom from the evils of the world, of one day meeting God face to face. At least one contemporary gospel singer suggests that the tune could have come from African origins as it's based on the pentatonic scale. We don't know for sure about that. The song is in our current hymnal published in 1993 when the hymnal began to reflect some of the African-American spiritual traditions. Interestingly, to my knowledge, the 1993 hymnal was the first one in all of the 20th century that this very popular gospel song appeared. It was not in our other two major hymnals of the century in 1937 and in 1961, both of those earlier hymnals published by the Unitarians and the Universalists. I can't say about the Universalist hymnals of the 19th century, if they had this song or not, but I know that the song did not cut the muster in Unitarian hymnals through the 19th and 20th century because the, the faith was mainly educated, enlightened people who likely didn't enjoy the evangelical heritage of the song. The theology of the song, however, is actually quite resonant with traditional 
18th and 19th century universalist theology, that there is a grace that holds us, that we say in our age, we speak of the love that will not let us go. Grace, what is it exactly? For upwards of two years now in my benediction, I tell you every Sunday to go with grace. What am I talking about? What is grace? One way, perhaps, is to start in our own familiar principles and sources. Now, you won't find the word grace mentioned there, granted. But consider the familiar seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. So it tells us, in rather scientific and rational language, that we are part of a larger whole. As the song said, we are not our own. Earth forms us. And consider the first source. We don't articulate the sources as often as I think we should. And the first one is, I think, a particularly strong one direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces that create and uphold life. So we're a part of a whole which renews us, creates us, upholds us, as if there's a bit of a personal relationship with the greater whole of all existence, a transcending mystery, it says. Though so much of our principles and even sources are in the language of rationalism and science, in the language of theology, perhaps, this means that we are part of the sacred and not just the sacred or God sitting on a cloud somewhere, but a part of a natural process in our lives and all life, a presence and a power and a context for life. The pervading reality in which we live, maybe we live in grace. Says our own poet in the congregation, Lisa Marie, Through translucent petals and gossamer sprouts, glowing within you and flowing without, we honor the light. So, there's light in us and yet beyond us. Our light, our possibility, our agency and character in the world. In some versions of traditional Christian theology, we have the idea, of course, that humanity has fallen from grace. There are different permutations about this, but the most known is the idea of original sin that we are each born into original sin and must receive salvation through Christ or suffer eternal damnation. This doctrine has created many a Unitarian Universalist, I think, and not a few atheists with its idea of a judgmental and wrathful God and the dark beginnings of of the primacy of human life. Historically, this idea of the fall from grace, as I've described it, helped to create both the Unitarian and Universalist communities. Unitarian, of course, Unitarianism, of course, emerged in early America as a liberal reaction against this idea, the idea of original sin, though the Unitarians got their name for their idea of the place of Christ, that is, that Jesus was essentially human, not on a co-equal basis with God the Father and thus not God. So the uh, early Unitarian's Christology was Unitarian, not Trinitarian. What really separated them from the more traditional Puritan Congregationalists of the 18th to 19th century was their doctrine of humanity. William Ellery Channing, the great minister around whom uh, the liberal churches emerged into their own association in 1825, 
the, probably, I think, the core idea of all of his theology was that of what he called self-culture and what he termed as salvation by character. He saw the human creature rightly in, very, in a very traditional sense as created in the image of the divine, but he accentuated the idea of our self-development to the point where we grew over the generations fairly certain of our own, if not perfection, our own perfectibility. And though this is not untrue, I think that we, over the generations on the Unitarian side of our heritage, grew a little complacent and a lot privileged by the idea that we knew more than anybody else, that we were the educated religionists, and that kind of tells me why Amazing Grace as a song didn't make it into our hymn book. And when it did in 1993, and a lot of you will know this, back when we're, we're worshiping in person and you can actually hold a hymn book, you will notice that uh, in the Unitarian Universalist version of that hymn, there's a little asterisk next to wretch. So if you don't want to declare yourself as a wretch, the footnote says you can call yourself a soul because heaven forbid that a Unitarian Universalist uh, believer might be a wretch. We, of course, are far too enlightened to be that. The Universalist side of our heritage was another way to rebel against this idea of original sin, but they did it really differently from the Unitarians by affirming the need for salvation, but declaring that everybody was saved universally. They even got to the point where they declared that even non-Christians were saved, and that was a radical thought in that day. Unfortunately, I think we have retained less in our corporate memory and in our culture in Unitarian Universalism of our Universalist heritage and I remain convinced that we need to affirm our universalist roots more to face the issues of the 21st century living as we do in a global diverse economy and, and humanity. Whatever is the final truth of all this speaking of, of salvation theory, which the fancy word for that is soteriology, whatever the truth of it is, some authors have suggested that we can only know grace when we fall, but not fall from grace, to fall with grace and into grace. Philip Simmons was the author of the very popular book published in 2000, Learning to Fall, The Blessings of an Imperfect Life. He was a member of North Shore Unitarian Church in Deerfield, Illinois, and an associate editor of the UU World around that point, our national magazine. He had a promising literary career. And then he contracted ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, and he wrote this book for, uh, as he navigated the challenge of that disease. He died in 2002, a very early death to a very promising life. And quoting from that book, Learning to Fall, and this is an extended quote, so just kind of relax into it. He says, think again of falling as a figure of speech. We fall in our faces. We fall for a joke. We fall in love. In each of these falls, what do we fall away from? We fall from ego. We fall from our carefully constructed identities, our reputations, our precious selves. We fall from ambition. We fall from grasping. We fall at least temporarily from reason. And what do we fall into? We fall into passion, into terror, into unreasoning joy. We fall into humility, into compassion, into emptiness, into oneness with forces larger than ourselves, into oneness with others whom we realize are likewise falling. We fall at last into the presence of the sacred, into godliness, into mystery, 
into our better diviner natures. He says we are all, all of us, falling. We are all now, this moment in the midst of that descent, fallen from heights that may seem only, that may now seem only a dimly remembered dream, falling toward a depth that we can only imagine, glimpsed beneath the water's surface shimmer. And so let us pray that if we are falling from grace, dear God, let us also fall with grace to grace. If we are falling toward pain and weakness, let us also fall toward sweetness and strength. And if we are falling toward death, let us also fall toward life. It is so difficult, though, to fall from all that we work for, plan for, from our ambitions, our grasping, our visions. Most of us are familiar with yin and yang from ancient Chinese philosophy. Yin and yang uh, posit a dualistic nature of all reality, describing how seemingly opposite or contrary forces may actually be complementary, interconnected, and interdependent in the world, and how they give rise to each other as they interrelate to one another. Yin is more inactive energy. Yang is more active energy. Yin, for example, is more darkness. Yang is more light. And the wisdom of that philosophy is that there are th those two kinds of energy necessary in, in the construct of reality, not just in the human creature, but throughout life. I think one small example of that, some of you are familiar with the very popular spiritual writer Richard Rohr, who's a Franciscan priest, and he heads up what he calls the Center for Action and Contemplation, in the outskirts of Albuquerque, New Mexico, the Center for Action, Yang Energy, and Contemplation, Yin Energy. And it's those two kinds of energy working together that, uh, that his philosophy seemed to dwell within. And he's both, I think, full of wisdom about the nature of the, of the inner characters, done particularly good work uh, uh, with that, and also in the greater world, and has a real social justice thrust to the, to the work, but it's rooted in contemplation. Jack Owensby is an Episcopal bishop for Western Louisiana, and in a recent book of his called Looking for God in Messy Places, he says, perhaps even more distressing to us is the realization that life is a mysterious gift to be received, not a planned outcome that we can control. Now, in the slide that was up just a moment ago, it said that simply that life is a mysterious gift to be received, not a planned outcome that we can control. But the fuller quote, he says, that it's even more distressing to us that it is so. And I found that very interesting that he would say that we are distressed by the fact that life is a mysterious gift. <laughs> you would think we would gladly receive this. But he is suggesting that we so often do not. That we are wanting to plan things so much and to control things so much that we can miss the true beauty and elegance and sacredness of life. In the story today that Sarah, Sarah told, The Magical Yet, suggests the saying that we do what we can and we must do what we can, but we can't control the final outcome. You've got to learn to ride your bicycle and you get proficient enough and maybe you'll learn how to really use the bicycle well. But you can never master it so quickly, it takes, the book says, days, weeks, months, sometimes years to do everything that you need to learn how to do. The yet, 
that ultimate aim is beyond our immediate control. Still, we work toward it, and if life blesses us and graces us with the outcome, we might achieve that. The book says, this yet finds a way even when you don't, and yet knows you will when you think you won't. So there's an element of faith to that, that we, we get by giving up control. It says, the good news is this, this yet grows with you. So there's a relationship between this ultimate outcome of reality and our own agency. Sarah's mentioning that the not yet of our religious enrichment program for children and youth will continue without her as she moves on to another full-time job and yet stays in the congregation. For we've done our work, we had the staffing and the leadership in place. And I I think this was a particularly wise uh, meaning to get from that story because it strikes me that I need to say the same to you as you as a congregation transition to a new minister, one you have wisely called by a democratic vote recently, as I began the transition to another congregation. I think each of us needs to remember that in that movement, in that transition, not everything will be perfect. There will be gaps, mishaps, mistakes likely. But are we looking for perfection or are we looking for community? Are we doing that with a sense of urgency or an awareness of unfoldment, of a curiosity about how the yet might be emerging in our lives? Are we awake to the grace of life, the grace of religious community, the grace of growth, natural, slow growth, with a growing of the roots in the sense of the deepening and flowering in abiding love in our free church traditions? To go into our futures, you and me, with grace. It is to go into our futures, you and me, expectantly, doing what we can, but letting go of the results. I say this about myself as much as you. There's a reason I'm preaching a sermon about grace, for <laughs> I need to be reminded of grace. I am learning to trust the future with a spirit of holy curiosity and possibility. Grace, I am learning, can't be manufactured. It's discovered. And it's usually discovered in the most unexpected of places. May you, in all you do, find grace and bring faith to guide your journey home. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>
we, we extinguish the flame, the flame but not the light, the light of truth, the warmth, warmth of the community, community, or the, the fire of commitment. commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Remember, my friends, we haven't just been to church. We are the church. And when the church is the church, it is nothing more, it is nothing less, it is nothing other than a place of grace in a hurting world. This week in all you do, be the church, be grace. Go in peace and grace. Amen. Spirit of life, come unto me. Sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion. Good job.